So today we are here to talk about this topic titled The Interconnections Between Land, Water, and the Human Heart. It's hosted in collaboration with the Global Peace Initiative of Women. So I feel this is a very important topic to me and to the four of us. We're here to present today um, the, the land, well, in this day and age, in this time that we live in, there's a deep disconnection between, between these three. The land is treated as something that we just abuse, um, exploit, extract resources from, uh, take what we desire from, and then just do away with, like if it's dead or inert. The water, we just pollute it, uh, squander it, waste it, divert it to suit our, what everyone, <laughs> lay claim to it and the heart well it just somehow it's either not there or the very term the heart is corrupted to mean the the part of us that that desires that has greeds um that is the source of our selfishness and cravings and and lust so Today we're here to, to try to change that um, view, although a lot of you, I'm, I'm sure you all are not the ones who have that perspective, but in the general mass of, of the population um, and from the perspective of education, it's necessary that we do change this view. And the land is really something deeply sacred that gives to us abundantly in so many different ways. Everything materially that we need comes from the land. And in its natural state, it nourishes us deeply. I'm sure everyone has that experience where they go out into the, the wilderness, in nature, in a park, in, in some natural setting. <clears throat> and they just feel that, that peace, that, that joy, that, that um, feeling of, of being settled and, and bringing back to home. <clears throat> the water as well has this deeply nourishing quality. It not only sustains all life physically, but it, it fills us with this nourishing energy, inspiration. And the heart is really the, the center around which all our activities should be revolved and around which our relationship with everything, the world, the land, the water, people, everything in existence should be centered. So with this introduction, I, um, well, we were supposed to go into a more form, a deeper introduction toward um, of our speakers. So we chose to kind of to each one of us to give an introduction of each other. So I could start by giving an introduction of Alex, a little bit more in detail than what Michelle has done. Um, so Alex Epstein is a farmer, artist, community leader, environmental activist, and change maker from the United States. He has been working um, with the urban creators using farming, food, education, and um, other means to and, and the creation of business as well to heal divisions, create abundance, uh, unite in rural communities. Um, sorry, not rural in a uh, urban communities in the United States. So the urban creators works in North Philadelphia in racially segregated um, on uh, in in communities of. of unequal economic opportunity, um, to put it lightly. And he has done immense work in these communities through Urban Creators. It was founded in 2010. And since then, Urban Creators has done a lot of uh, excellent work in transforming three acres of vacant land into a network of flourishing urban gardens, public green spaces, venues for artistic expression, community organizing, collaborative leadership, and they feed many families every year, provide over 125 jobs, um, give space for artists to, to showcase their talent, 
and um, yeah, and, and amongst many other activities, which I'm sure I'm not even aware of because they're new. Uh, so yeah, with that, I would like to hand over the, uh, the microphone to Alex. <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, I'll also just burst the bubble. The four of us are, are good friends, hence the like wanting to introduce each other and shower one another with love. So thanks for starting with me. Um, but I have the honor of introducing, introducing Crystal, Crystal Foreman. Uh, I'm going to start off script first and just say that Crystal is an incredible farmer, gardener, vegan chef, educator, organizer, and just like a just a badass person all the way around when you get to know Crystal. Um, more formally, uh, Crystal is a, has a master in public health and is the owner of uh, Holistic Wellness and Health, which is a business um, that focuses on healthy living, easy, nutritious, delicious, and fun with a focus on plant-based foods to help you live a healthier, more compassionate, and more vibrant life. Crystal uses a whole, a holistic person approach to a focus on mind, body, and soul and spirit to improve the quality of life of all beings, which I know to be very true. I can attest. Uh, holistic wellness and health offers healthy plant-based cooking classes, wellness, wellness workshops, health coaching, gardening consultation, and mindfulness meditation uh, Crystal also works to improve food justice and food sovereignty and sustainable food access, primarily in Baltimore, but also and beyond. And in addition to her public health administration degrees, Crystal is a certified permaculture designer and certified Baltimore City Master Gardener. Um, what wasn't in her bio is that she's also done a lot of the grueling behind the scenes often unseen work of building relationships between farmers and gardeners and educators and organizers throughout Baltimore, which as an urban farmer in another city is way harder than growing food sometimes, is like building connections with people who could be competitors in our capitalist society and forming relationships so that we can all collaborate for the greater good. Crystal has done incredible, incredible work in Baltimore in that way which was my first of many admirations of Crystal, um, first of many. So I'm gonna pass it to Crystal. Thank you, Alex. Happy greetings, everyone. I have the pleasure of introducing Shafali Patel. So Shafali Patel is a traditional ecologist, regenerative farmer and educator. Her work is focused on building models and thought leadership around ecological stewardship, restoration, education and justice that centers equity, dignity, and interconnection. As a farmer, she is learning not only how to grow food to feed stomachs and soil, but also how to nourish social and racial justice movements so intimately tied with the earth. As an educator, she strives to engender the study of the original three R's, regeneration, reverence, and remembering. Through a lens of land as pedagogy, she has designed and facilitated several flagship educational programs to train beginner farmers, K through 12 youth, and climate activists that empower them to develop pathways of access to underserved communities and lay the foundations for a more than human future powered by ancestral wisdom and interspecies collaboration. She currently serves as the Bastyr University's Director of Gardens and the Sacred Seeds Project, and is engaged in council and earth activism with work with organizations like Global Peace Initiative of Women, Plum Village Earth Holders, and Just Food. And I love everyone on this panel, so I'm excited to be here with everyone, and I thank GPIW as well. So Shafali, I will hand it over to you. Thanks, Crystal. Hi, friends. Happy Friday. Um, yeah, I echo everything everyone said. So grateful to be here with all of you and um, in such incredible company. Our panelists, they're incredible humans. And just want to um, 
give gratitude for you for all listening to the backgrounds that we all come from, because I think it's really important to get a sense of where we're coming from so you'll understand um, maybe like how we're weaving this conversation together a little bit better. So I get the honor of um, introducing Javed. Um, you've heard a little bit from him, but he's an incredible human being. There's so many different dimensions to him. Javed Omardine lives and practices organic and ecological sustainable farming in Brasso Seco, a small mountain village in the Caribbean island of Trinidad. He works on an evolving farming system that aims to support, nourish, and enrich both native and cultivated species while providing food for humans. The forest is extremely fertile, provides food for all, supports life on every level, and is not only resilient to damage, but can regrow from scratch at any moment. Javed tries to learn from these teachings, modeling ways to cultivate food crops in a way that encourages a diverse range of life forms while being as productive as possible. This is mainly done by interplanting fruit trees and food plants with native forest trees and shrubs that complement and support each other. Cacao, coffee, citrus, annatto, bananas, various ground provisions are among the many crops that he cultivates. Javed also works alongside his family in a small chocolate making business, taking the raw cacao they grow and making healthy and nourishing chocolate products. He is also part of the local farmers association, a small community based NGO. Through his work in this organization, Javed has helped coordinate and facilitate trainings to encourage beekeeping as a supplement to sustainable farming for members of the community. So Javed basically farms chocolate, coffee, and honey in the gardens of Trinidad. So whenever I think of Javed, he just reminds me of all of the sweetness and the joys available to us as human beings on the planet. It's incredible. And uh, just a, a little bit of a plug, um, Javed's chocolate is amazing. So if you get a chance to get a hold of it. I highly recommend it. Um, so today we're gonna to just have a very casual conversation with all of you as part of it. We're gonna start um, by kind of raising some questions that have been floating in our minds a little bit, um, which Javed will introduce in a minute. And then we're just gonna keep a good amount of time for Q and A so that you can ask your questions. Um, we can try to support some of the things that you've been thinking about. Thanks, Javed, do you wanna introduce the questions? Sure. So um, thank you, Shavak, for that beautiful introduction. Uh, yeah. So these, we, we just came up with three um, broad questions for the, uh, to frame our discussion around. And the first one is, how do we as educators support the youth in connecting with land and water through heart intelligence? So I'll leave that open to any of you three. Oh, okay. so are we going to read all of them? Or should should we read all of them? Yeah. Um, the second one is related. It would be what would be the components of such an educational approach or program B? And the third one is why why is it that um, why is what we do important and uh, what support could we get to continue doing this work? Krista, you are muted. All right, so <laughs> I will start us off. Um, yeah, so just the questions about how we as educators work with the youth. Um, I've been working with the youth and particularly in Baltimore City for several years, teaching them how to grow food, harvest it, preserve it, sell it, cook it, all of those things, how to make it into an enterprise and how to um, Know, make it a living off of um, working with the land, but also how to respect the land as we're working with it, how to connect with the land, how to um, respect the water that we use um, to help grow our food. So it's a lot of inter, you know, connection there, teaching them how to connect with the trees and, you know, incorporating meditation. So everything I do is holistic with their mind, body, and spirit you know, all together in their soul. So, um, you know, just 
looking at them as whole beings and having them, the youth look at other beings as well um, with compassion and looking at themselves with compassion. Um, a lot of communities, um, people, like just really any community, there are a lot of people, we don't have self-compassion for ourselves and it's hard to have compassion for other beings when you don't have compassion for yourself. And so um, teaching our youth, you know, how to have self-love and be compassionate, you know, with themselves and how they talk to themselves, um, you know, and that translates to other beings, to their community, to their family, and it just kind of goes out, um, you know, out there. So um, I do a lot of teaching, especially the past few years outside, which is beautiful. Um, so just, you know, using um, PPE and all of the proper no safety precautions, but just working outside with the land and letting um, them get intimately um, reconnected to the land. Yeah. Um, so just, you know, having them be motivated to change, not just for themselves, but for their um, community as well. And that just becomes a bigger thing where they're starting to think about the earth um, and all of its beings. So I will turn it over. Hi, um, thanks uh, for that, Krista. I, I really feel inspired by the work that you do. Um, yeah, and, and, and nourishing that deeper love that all of us need to cultivate. And, and, and it, it is internal. It is something that we have to cultivate in ourselves and then it spreads out. Uh, if we don't have it inside, well then, yeah, it's really difficult to, to get it. Um, so, yeah, I would say, so my perspective is, a little bit different to um, the others. I work with more young adults, although I really love, I, I'm drawn to, to um, maybe in the future work with children as well. But um, from my, my background or my um, experience, I found that different people have different, uh, th there should be different approaches to different individuals and at different times too. Some people, um, are more concerned, well, in, in terms of, let's say, farming or just in general, they're more concerned about the death of species, wildlife, they're really deeply connected to animals, to living things. And um, it's important to encourage that way you see it, uh, try to, to show them, educate them about the different creatures that are there that, that we kill without even noticing it. In the soil, there's so many billions of organisms that we just destroy. <clears throat> and not even knowing that they're there. And then they're bigger creatures as well that, that really um, can resonate to them and they can uh, they can relate to, to, to the necessity of their life and the beauty of their life um, and the beauty of, of how each creature has its own unique place and its unique expression in nature. Uh, there's some people who care more about pollution they they find they they discuss it with the the garbage the situation of the the ever increasing amount of plastic and waste. So for these people, you know, educating them about where does the the waste go. A lot of people are disconnected, especially in my country. The waste goes in a, a bin, <clears throat> and then where there's a a, a government um, agency that that collects the waste and and sends it to a landfill, and people don't see it, you know, or they they send it behind the house and in poor communities um in the in the drain or in yeah in some um, water course and it just ends up uh yeah it just ends up going to the sea clogging up polluting killing wildlife as well so i think people need to become aware of these things um, and simply educating them about where the waste goes is is really helpful there's some people who are, are concerned, like especially in the farming or other people, those who have illnesses, cancers or whatever, are concerned about the food that they eat and the poisons that are, have been put into them. So educating people about this, um, pushing that where, where you see it is, is really um, helpful. But there's also a category of people who have genuine economic needs and they can't see beyond um, what is important for them at this moment to survive. <clears throat> and we have to be aware of this. Um, and for these people, it's important to provide alternatives. In, in 
and they are sustainable ways to make a living and for it to be very profitable as well and as well and help the environment work uh, interconnected with the environment. And lastly, well, there's, there's a, a smaller subset of people who are open to the sense of the sacred in everything. And wherever you see that, it needs to be pushed because I think that's really, really um, precious. And above all, to use a higher or deeper guidance um, in what we do because not every, it, it, it's not possible for us to uh, plan out a, a, a response, a plan response to every situation and then say, this is what we're going to do in each situation at each moment, the necessity changes and we can, a part of us knows what is the right thing to do and we have to get in touch with that part so that we can make the right action at the right time. And each one of these actions that I said, actually could, could in, put in its, in its wrong place or the wrong person could be disastrous. So it's important to, to be able to relate to that deeper guidance and use that as the basis for how we act. So yeah, I'm gonna send that across. Um, this conversation is start, start I, I didn't think prepare for this at all. So I'm just kind of going off the energy flow. And for some reason, I think like some of what Crystal and Javet were talking about just makes me kind of think about what were the biggest, like the most impactful learning moments I've had in my life, particularly as it relates to reconnecting with the earth and land and water. And I just, I don't, none of what's coming, so many things are coming to mind and none of them were in the classroom. Uh, they just weren't like, I don't know. I bet there was something, but it's really the moments that affected me as a student, current, which I still am, we all still are, are moments where sort of curriculum broke down a little bit, either on purpose or by accident. And as a result, that like teacher student barrier broke down a little bit, either on purpose or by accident. And there would be moments where there was just like a shared learning experience outside in the world in one kind of way or another. I think I say on purpose or accident because I I think I've experienced both where I've had some really profound teachers who very intentionally broke some of those barriers down and led you know, my class when I was younger into like experiences where we would just be and relate to in one another and engage. And sometimes like not the best teachers or, or situations that just like totally unraveled out of like my teacher's like control that I ended up learning a lot more from than any kind of lesson. And it's making me think of a moment too, when I was, I guess, speaking to that like breakdown of teacher student moment, I, uh, I had a summer job like 10 years ago where I was an assistant teacher in a summer school and elementary school. And it's like two weeks in, it's just like, we were trying to get these kids to learn about like measurement and vocabulary or whatever. And it's like, they were bored. I was bored. Everybody was bored. Everybody was miserable and just waiting for the day to end every single day. Like, and it was summer school. So it's like, really everybody just wants to be outside. So we were extra bored and miserable. And one day I left work and just decided to walk home. And this was in New York City. And I started kind of like wander meandering my way home through Central Park. And something just called to me, like, go off the path. And so I hopped over the little like two foot fence thing and just like wandered. And all of a sudden I happened to be in this part of Central Park I'd never been in before because it's like beyond where you're supposed to go. It was like North Woods. And all of a sudden, like, I couldn't tell that I was in the city anymore. And I'd never had that experience in New York City in my life. And I saw, like, one of those big older Central Park trees falling over. And, like, the roots were just, like, all exposed like that. And I don't know. It was just, like, a huge learning moment for myself that was, like, off the beaten path, totally unplanned, and yet immersive and intimate in a way and so I ended up going back to class the next day and probably the best thing in the world was that the head teacher called out sick. So I, I was in charge and I was like, screw it. We're going to grow beans. 
And so like, we just got out and took a walk and then we started growing beans. And then like four weeks later they had sprouted. And so all of the lessons we ended up doing were about like measuring the growth of the stems or looking at the making connections between like, what do these roots look like? You know, we see the root, you know, the beans growing in the baggies on the window. And it's like, what else does that look like? And, you know, kids were saying, it looks like lightning or it looks like rivers or it looks like my veins, like in my arm. And it's like, yeah, we're, we're all connected. And it just kind of like snowballed. And I made a ton of mistakes and did a lot of dumb stuff. But it, I, I think that that breakdown of teacher in charge to like students learning went away because it was like clearly we were learning together kind of a thing and I learned as much in all of that as they did for sure and I think that that was very obvious to the kids as I like stumbled my way through it all but I know I, that was like a profound learning experience for me and a lot of those kids who I'd stayed in touch with for a few years like also learned a lot they learned how to measure so like yay check um, but also like appreciating nature in a different kind of a way so sorry to like story tangent but there's something in there I'm, I'm learning as I talk now but like something in there about breaking down those like institutional barriers I feel like we need to like de-institutionalize ourselves and decolonize the way that we approach what education is as a big part of this like question about reconnection to the earth and each other and body and spirit I love story tangents. I think everything, our entire lives are story tangents. Um, how to add on to all of this. I, I mean, I echo everything that Javed, Crystal, and Alex have said. Um, you know, the question is, how do we support youth in connecting with the land, the water, and their own hearts? And for me, like I, you know, I just see that connection is already there. It's always there. Um, and the land, the water, and our human hearts um, share the same language, and that language is completely antithetical to the dominant systems that we're currently functioning in um, that promote colonialism and capitalism and racism and these extractive systems. And so that language of the land, the water, and the heart is what guides me in figuring out how to create the spaces that support youth in um, becoming who they truly need to be, who they are, valuing, valuing them outside of these systems. And the education systems that we've created are designed to support these extractive systems. And so I, I feel like my job as an educator is to hold a space that pushes back against that, that allows us to actually um, emphasize and lift up all of the values that are being de-emphasized in extractive cultures and mainly doing everything out of love, um, keeping everything relational. You know, we live in a world that's been isolating us and keeping us separate and bringing youth out into the farm, into the forest, into the world, reminds them that they aren't isolated and that they are part of this larger ecosystem. And allowing the land, the water, these large ecosystems to actually be the teachers, you know, like stepping back and saying, let's center the voices of the beings that have been silenced, like the trees. They have so much to teach us. I mean, they're, they're the elders of the elders. Um, giving students a chance to interact with other beings and starting to form a conception of a world where humans aren't centric, where we are not pushing thoughts and ideologies of human supremacy um, is critically important because without that worldview, we will never come out of the crises that we're undergoing. Um, allowing students to actually get in touch with their own talents and um, finding ways to actually uplift their talents and help them grow into the beings that they are um, and keeping everything that we're teaching relational to their lives and their communities and holding everything accountable to these families and these communities that we're a part of. A lot of what we do in education is kind of just like data and knowledge, again, isolated 
from any context and any relationships. Um, and a lot of the work that I do, I try to keep all of that um, and all of us kind of accountable to the people that we care the most about and the people that we want to support. Um, and there's many ways of doing this, but um, I'm still learning. I mean, I think a lot of what we are doing, the four of us at least, is kind of we're students in the process too. Like we're also learning about the land and the water and our own hearts and our visions in the process. Um, and so our ability to support youth in this endeavor is completely connected to our openness and our willingness to also like be there learning along with them. And Alex mentioned, um, you know, just breaking down that kind of hierarchy around teacher and students. Like that step alone, I feel like is, enough to start like leading by example and saying, you know, there's like another way of being another world that we can enter into and leadership and empowerment can look like this. Um, yeah. And so anyway, I just, you know, I think there's a lot of, a lot of interconnections to be explored in our work. And so a lot of what we do kind of it's evolving and it's looking different as we grow along with it. And I think being open to that and having the courage of doing that in a system that kind of doesn't see that as valuable, that alone is super important um, and sets an example for like the students that we're with. Anyway, yeah, I think like there's a, there's a lot more I can talk about. I'm trying to really like curve it because of time. Um, I think we can start talking about in addition to like how we support students and being able to work um, with the model of interconnection and relational uh, ways of being, uh, we also wanted to talk a little bit about what the components of an educational program like that would look like. So, you, you know, we, we really like start to like ground what we're talking about in like tangible models that folks can work with and replicate. So if anyone wants to speak on that. Okay, so um, a couple of years ago, I started a program um, to work with, with the youth, um, a holistic agriculture and um, cooking program. It's originally just a pilot six weeks, and last year we made it into three months. And um, some of the components of the program started with us meditating in the morning, um, just getting connected with ourselves and with the land, and then um, seeing what needed to be done on the farm. So um, just, you know, kind of taking survey of what needed to be taken care of um, and letting them have a lot of responsibility. So I was more of a, I guess, a assist, I, I was assisting <laughs> more than anything um, and letting them, you know, have a lot of say in what needed to be done um, because they were, we called them our junior farmers. And so the, a lot of them have been on the farm for three, four, five years. And then we also had some new people coming in and learning. And it's been very important, I think, especially for their mental health these past couple of years to be able to still gather in a safe manner, still be able to support um, themselves um, financially, as well as supporting their communities. Um, we were doing, or still are, doing a produce box program where um, we're giving out free produce to the community. So they're learning you know how to you know, feed the community and actually going to senior places and making sure that they have food. Um, and then part of what I do um, with, and it became very important when um, this past couple of years, a lot of people didn't know what to do with the fresh produce. <laughs> and so, um, or they didn't even know what some of the produce was at all. So. Um, Part of the education became for me teaching not just the youth but the adults as well how to use the produce that was grown on the farm how to use the produce from the produce boxes um, and actually you know letting them see the process so that they could see how easy it is because it's important for people to see you know it's not hard to work with butternut squash and it's not hard to work with all of these things like if they see me do it like it's becomes a lot simpler and they'll, they'll do it too um, and so I've noticed that um, just bringing the experience to them, doing actual hands-on cooking, giving them recipes, they're able to go home and replicate. 
And I always teach them, you know, use what you have. So if you don't have one thing, you know, substitute something else, um, you know, you can still make the recipe, make it your own. So giving them those tools so that they're not afraid to, you know, just um, experiment, experiment with the food that they're growing um, and teaching others to experiment with it as well. Um, so it's teaching them, I didn't do this personally as much as others um, on a team, but having them go to the farmer's markets and actually, you know, sell that produce, teaching them how to communicate with others and how to handle disputes, how to um, professionally and appropriately, and just, um, you know, helping them to inter like integrate as well as participate in the community in a different manner, um, where they also had say and some power um, was very important for them and still is. So yeah, just, you know, giving them the tools and to be able to have flexibility because um, I would, I could have an outline and kind of say we can do, but letting them actually control and be leaders um, because they can't really learn leadership just by looking at another leader. They need to actually experience leadership and be leaders. And then I can kind of just back off and just make sure everything's okay. And, you know, I know that if I'm not there or if something else is going, like they can handle it. They can, you know, go forward and, um, you know, and make careers out of growing food and cooking food and all of those things as well. So just giving them those tools, um, I think it's been very important. Yeah. Next person. Yeah, so, I can. Oh, go ahead, Javed. Yeah, I I don't want um to us to run uh, over time too much with, the, but uh, well, from my personal um work it. Where it's, it's more with, like I said before, we're um, young adults and it's really about um, we're trying to provide alternatives uh, for the conventional chemical farming, which is what most people do. Uh, information is also a part of it because farmers, well, people, a lot of people who I work with, they, they do farming to make a living um, as their only source of um, economic uh, sustenance and when they have a problem they go to the agricultural supply shop unfortunately or they ask another farmer and the dominant um, type of farming is the chemical farming in my country so it's it, first of all they just don't have the information um, and and yeah so I, I try to get, provide to them the information but also sh show them alternative not only ways in which they could deal with problems that they have, but also crops that they could produce that are also, that are very profitable, that don't get too much pest and disease and um, are able to, yeah, provide for them economically or otherwise. And on another level, shifting the mindset of agriculture, which is, of course, just about control, about trying to get something from a plant or, or produce, plant a plant to get a, a result and, and where, where applicable, where a person is receptive to it, it's important to, to try to push that, that aspect that the plants really give to us in love. And although we, yes, we do cultivate the plants to an extent from one perspective, another perspective is that they, it's a relationship that we have with them, um, a deep relationship where they provide for us more so when we take care of them and, and nourish them and, and love them and respond in the same way that they respond to us. So yeah, that's uh, my uh, small perspective. Maybe Alex could add something to that. Yeah, I um, completely agree. <laughs> and um... I think the work that I do is probably in a lot of ways the most similar to, to what Crystal does in a way, although there's like so many overlaps. Um, but I think what I've learned a lot is um, that there is sort of a balance between in the programs I've been a part of that have worked really well. There's a balance between 
challenging young people to explore things that are outside of their comfort zone that they might not otherwise bother to explore with and balancing that with almost the opposite like embracing what young people are already passionate about and creating opportunities for them to follow their pre-existing passion as far as it may go and often like i've worked with hundreds of young adults and teens in, in philadelphia it's rare that the thing anybody's coming in or going out with is a passion about urban farming there's some but like a lot of young people are coming in much more interested in the arts or entrepreneurship or the idea of creating a small business or building and carpentry and the trades for example and so i've always felt like the the moments that we've hit like really beautiful and organic sort of sweet spots in these programs is where somehow there's a balance of those things where we're able to create the safe space where for the most part everybody feels comfortable being themselves and know that they can pursue the things that they're passionate about and dig deeper into those things because that's the hook you know if they feel like they can explore what they're already interested in I think we're all that way. Like that's that's why we buy into things. But the safety of the space also then creates the opportunity to then challenge people to challenge each other to like explore, you know, the other side of this or an angle that you haven't considered or an aspect of this that's like really kind of like weird and gross, but potentially, you know, if you look at it a different way, really beautiful. And yeah, I think the the best programs I've been a part of find a healthy balance of those of those two things. And I don't know that that's curriculumable. I don't know that you can quite capture that in like a structured thing. I think you can try, and then something will be a little off balance, and so then you readjust, and then you try, and then you readjust. And as a facilitator, um, I feel like we have to you know come in with our plans and our stuff, but like <laughs> be ready to embrace those moments where just because of the unique nature of a group and the dynamics between like the individuals and the students and the teachers and the land, you know, you might have class 10 Tuesdays in a row. Well, what if it rains 10 Tuesdays in a row? You got to roll with it. Um, so as a facilitator, having that like balance of like structure and flexibility in how you like capture the imaginations and excitements of young, excitement and passions of young people while challenging them to explore what is new. Yeah, I totally agree with Alex. I mean, I think part of it too. So I am, like, I'm a production farmer, but I'm also an educator. And that space um, is more than a place where we grow food. I mean, it's an incubator for everything. I mean, revolution uh, about people finding themselves again and exploring their interests. I work with a lot of youth and, and I agree with Alex, like especially youth of color, they are not into like, oh, I want to farm as my career. Like that's not why they're here. The main point is how can we allow this space to be um, a place where they can find themselves in the process and what they're interested in. And Alex, I've tried to make that semi curricular bowl. Um, although I'm, you know, I think it's like a loose framework where uh, if you are like trying to um, house and support these folks going through this process, like there's a way of starting out by like creating shared objectives where the youth are actually defining, as Alex said, their interests and then coming up with like the goals and, or like what they're interested in. Like I have these questions, like we want to explore that and so our jobs as educators is to figure out okay like this is what they need now how can i give them the tools and the resources that they need and how can i point them in the ways that would allow them to then like you know explore and search for their own information um also i see education as a process of becoming human like it's you know we're not born human we become human and education is a primary way in which we can do that and in that sense it's maybe the most deeply spiritual process and practice that we engage with as human beings. We're actually learning how to become 
at home in the world and what it means for us to be at home in the world. And it, what a gift to be able to steward that process for other folks while we're doing it for ourselves. And so I like to incorporate in whatever I'm doing, it doesn't matter what we're learning at the time, moments of silence and, and mindfulness so that we can create the pause in our own thoughts and in our humanness to actually be able to listen to everything else around us that has the wisdom and the lived experiences that we need to. Um, even if we're creating shared objectives and learning goals, like those shared objectives and learning goals, I so try to support the youth in figuring out how to tie it back to actual issues in their communities and fig like identify the exact people um, and projects that they can be accountable to while they work through this process and then give them the spaces to actually be of service, like make contributions so that they can be reminded of how much power they do have to impact the world. Um, and lastly, I, and I really want to put this forward because I think it's underestimated, making space for art and creative expression. Because um, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is raise leaders um, and equip them with the tools and the emotional capacity to actually meet the future that we're having to confront, which is a really difficult one. And so it requires people to build um, a new way of being that we might not even be able to imagine in the places that we're at. We're trying to go past all of the ways of being that we've seen and all of the things that we've done so far because they haven't been working. And that requires us to move to the very edges of our imagination. And so giving folks like the space to actually be able to explore what the boundaries of their creativity are and continue to move past them is really how we're going to raise folks that are going to create that world that we all wanna be in. So yeah, Crystal's giving me the hard stop. So I guess we're opening it up for Q and A. Um, and, you know, if you all want to answer any of the questions that we asked, or if you all just want to ask us questions, it's totally open at this time, and, um, yeah, go from there. So, I don't know, Michelle, are you, you're looking at the questions? Uh, yeah, I see nothing in the chat, but if somebody want to put up their hand, if they would like to ask a question. Okay, I see Claire. Claire, do you have a question? Um, hi, yeah. Um, it was really fascinating and inspiring to hear you guys talk about the different um, bits of work that you do. I, I just wanted to touch on the point. So I was a community organiser for um, four years and, and now trying to move more specifically. I worked on lots of different campaigns with young people and now trying to move more specifically into climate activism, connection with nature. Um, and I just wanted to pick up on... Um, somebody talked about how it's like more difficult to um, engage uh, young people of colour or basically in the, in the climate movement in the UK, it's like very white and middle class. Um, and the way that I was able to engage young people was by going to them and saying, you know, what do you care about? Um, what do you want to do? And so we had a group of young people that weren't just kind of like white middle class um people getting involved with with politics but I guess I'm interested in how do you I mean it, you kind of touched on it but I just wanted to expand it further it's like how do you go to young people and say what are you interested in while also having this thing of like you know what you're there you have an interest right you have a an objective and a vision of the world and so how do you couple that with going to those young people and saying, you know, what do you care about? What are you interested in? And like bringing them on the journey of nature connection without forcing them there. Um, so I know Alex, you talked about like, um, you know, some of them being interested in carpentry or, or whatever and trying to bring that in. But yeah, I was just, I don't know if that makes sense, but I was just wondering if you could kind of expand on that. Any of you?
Alex. Yeah, I don't I don't know how we know who is going to talk, but I'll I'll start. Um, <laughs> I think um, I, I honestly I don't know. I mean, like I'm still learning and making mistakes with that all the time, um, personally. But I feel like one layer is like it starts with trust building and it's not like okay sessions one through three are building trust and now trust is there and so then we can do the rest like that's forever and then you can build trust and break it real quick with anyone especially with young people I think often so a commitment to like trust building with young people in a personal way like bringing your full self like and vulnerable self to the table as a facilitator educator is really important in making young people or anyone really feel comfortable bringing a more raw version of themselves to the table. Um, and then staying committed to that along the way is really important, um, which can mean talking about what it is that you are or aren't passionate about and whatever, like as a, as a way, but without making it like all about you. And, um, but just as a way of like creating the container and the safe space for you know, people to be more willing to explore. And then as far as like creating different entry points, it really depends. Like there's a lot less flexibility to do stuff like that in school, just because at least in public schools here in the US, like you have to meet testing guidelines and that kind of like rules the universe and is the colonized structure that we need to burn to the ground, in my opinion, and compost and grow something anew. But there are ways to do it. But I think when you run programs like outside of a school setting, there's a lot more flexibility to like do real stuff and then engage young people in the doing of the real stuff. So it doesn't feel like it's just like a mock lab like what if scenario it's like no we're building this so learn how to build by helping us build this there's a total different energy that comes along with like the manifestation of something real and then you learn along the way from like carpentry one of them. sit in your seat and watch me do a slideshow type of thing and yeah and then I think like along that way if like trust is built in a certain kind of a way then that's when you can start to like push young people in new directions and challenge them and encourage them to explore sort of things beyond what it is that they're interested in but ideally they start doing that with each other and I think like the goal of facilitation is to become over time less and less centric and like allowing a lot of sort of the dynamics between like everyone to impact each other as opposed to this like one way teacher to student uh dynamic i guess i don't know if that really answers the question but that's what came to mind <clears throat> so looking at the time is we have about five minute more minutes in the session um does some, anybody have uh, maybe a final question or a final sort of sum, summing up or however you would like to end this session I was just going to say, just in response to what Claire was saying, it cut out, but, um, and it, it, it kind of makes sense with what we've been talking about too. Like we are talking about education and being facilitators for a program or two people. A lot of this involves, um, I don't know, Claire, if you were saying that you were trying to organize youth around like a political like objective, but I think a lot of our, what we need to deal with as adults and as facilitators is the letting go of some control and vision as to what we think needs to happen and really be like active participants in a process of co-creation with youth. And so many times we might um, be working with folks that like don't seem to share the kind of like directives that we do. And I think that's like an, it's a critical point of interaction because I think it gives us an opportunity to also like listen and hear what wants to emerge in the world through the voices of these younger people. Um, and that's a hard thing to do as a person who is trying to like translate concepts and like meet certain learning goals and stuff like that. But it's like part of possibly the most important component of the work. And yeah, I echo it. Like I'm learning that as a facilitator, as an organizer, as an activist in every way. Um, 
So yeah, it's hard. Like, I think it's about working with folks and like working with their um, affinities and the things that feel like are oppositional to them. I mean, it's just like the things that are coming out of them are definitely like just basically the things that we're all wrestling with. How do we work with them? I just got a private message from Crystal that Shefali will end with a poem. Yeah, okay, so I can I end with a poem. And I'm just um, going to drop, I'm going to drop the feedback form in the chat, just very sort of like uh, surreptitiously, just to let you know, uh, everybody, if they would add, fill in the form. So thank you. And sorry for intervening with that. No, thanks, Michelle, for, for all your support. And thank you all for joining us in this session. Um, I'm going to close out with a short poem. It's from one of my teachers who actually um, just passed. And so I think it's apropos for this discussion and it, it's a poem about interconnection. Um, breathing in, I see the element earth in me, the element air in me. I see clouds, snow, rain, and rivers in me. I see the atmosphere, wind and forests in me, the mountains and oceans in me. I see the earth in me, breathing out, I smile to the earth in me. I am one with Mother Earth, the most beautiful planet in our solar system. Breathing in, I see the stars and galaxies in me. I am consciousness manifesting as cosmos. I am made of stars and galaxies. Breathing out, I smile to the stars in me. I play my part in the immortality of clouds, rain, stars, and the cosmos. And um, that poem is by Thich Nhat Hanh. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I, I don't have a protocol for how everybody leaves. Thank you, Michelle. Michelle, thanks for all your support. Yeah. This is my first time I'm moderating on Ecoversity. So. Did really good. Did an excellent job. Thank you. All right. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. See you guys.